The largest mass execution in U.S. history was first commemorated with a four-ton granite marker that read, Here were hanged 38 Sioux Indians, December 26, 1862. The monument was erected in Mankato, Minnesota, after being given by Judge Lauren Cray, and boasted a white triumphalist narrative of the war without the native Dakota being represented. When discussions arose in the 1990s to re-erect the monument, it suddenly vanished. Its location is still unknown. During the 1800s, Minnesota was known for its fur trade, specifically beaver furs from the many lakes and rivers, and a massive amount of buffalo on the prairies. The fur trade brought whites to the area, who created ecological problems from overhunting including the buffalo, who were nearly hunted to the point of extinction. And there's a letter um, that uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote uh, saying, we have to sign that, that American Indian nations are sovereign nations and we can't just take their land. Um, and they're not just going to give it to us. So we have to get them in debt so that they'll be inclined to uh, sell us their land treaties and so we should do that. Governor Alexander Ramsey saw farming as the best option to make the area a strong state and eventually President Abraham Lincoln came to agree with him. The fur trade was a failing enterprise and the natives were forced into signing treaties. On July 23, 1851, the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux was signed on the banks of the Minnesota River near St. Peter. The Sioux bands of the area agreed to Ramsey's request to give over their land in exchange for payments and goods. Today the location of the treaty site is a museum in the Nicollet County Historical Society where guests can visit the cabin and view displays that describe not only the history of the area but also the treaty and the U.S. Dakota War. The treaty ultimately forced the Dakota onto a small reservation on a strip of land near the river. The government did not keep up with their promises from the treaty to pay the total sum of the land, and without a proper source of food from hunting, the Dakota began to starve. In May of 1862, Lincoln signed the Homestead Act, which called for settlers to move to Minnesota. The act brought up to 75,000 whites to the state, which further pushed natives onto the reservations. On August 17th, four Dakota men were returning from an unsuccessful hunt. They stopped at a local homestead, and after confrontation, the Dakota men killed five white settlers and stole their horses to escape. Although this was not a planned attack, Chief Little Crow and the Santee decided to use the event as a way to stand up to the United States tyranny over their people. With most of the military-aged men gone fighting in the Civil War, Ramsey looked toward the new settlers of the state and anyone who was left to fight. A militia was formed under the leadership of Colonel Henry H. Sibley. As Minnesota's first governor from 1858 to 1860, Sibley not only had interest in the state's success, but he was also part owner in the American Fur Company, which he relocated to St. Paul just across the river from Fort Snelling. Sibley was appointed to lead the militia against the Dakota Uprising and immediately began mobilizing troops. Between August and September, the battles raged on. New Ulm on August 19th, Fort Ridgely from August 20th to the 22nd, and another strike on New Ulm on August 23rd. Eventually, New Ulm citizens were evacuated to Mankato and St. Paul because of low food supplies and the fear of casualties. On September 2nd, the Battle of Birch Coulee broke out and was ultimately a Dakota victory. This was said to have been the hardest battle of the war with a total of 13 casualties, 47 injured, and a loss of 90 horses. The final battle occurred on September 23rd at Wood Lake. The Dakota ultimately were defeated and the so-called uprising was stopped. Uh, in a lot of ways in 1862, the public wanted the Dakota out of Minnesota, not everyone, but that was a that was a societal truth at that time that um, a lot of people said, you got to remove these Dakota people from Minnesota. So the government needed to placate them, but doing that, removing the Dakota, um, wouldn't make their friends any money. So they had to do something big and showy that wouldn't actually accomplish any goals.
After the war, the remaining Dakota were separated. On November 7th, nearly 1,600 Native Americans, the majority of women, children, and elders, were marched to Fort Snelling to be placed in an internment camp. During the winter of 1862, an estimated 300 people died from outbreaks of disease, starvation, and freezing. The site is now home to a spillover parking lot and a gazebo with a plaque. There are also ceremonial ribbons, wreaths, and flags that fill the area in remembrance of those that died. Another large group of Dakota men were also transported to a camp in Davenport, Iowa, called McClellan, where another 120 Dakota men died. On December 26th, at 10 o'clock in the morning, 38 Dakota men were executed by hanging. The site was near the river. A stage-like platform was built specifically for the occasion. This scene is illustrated in W.H. Child's lithograph, which originally appeared in Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper in 1863. Soldiers are seen separating the crowd of citizens and the Dakota men. This was the largest mass execution in United States history. After the execution, the bodies were quickly buried in unmarked graves, later to be dug up and used for medical research. In 1912, 50 years after the hanging of the 38, a wealthy Mankato judge named Lauren Cray erected a stone marker at the infamous site of the hangings. The six foot high, four foot wide granite stone weighed around four tons and was eerily similar to a headstone in a cemetery. The marker was placed without historical context or any explanation as to what actually occurred in the U.S. Dakota War. This memorial was to a military victory over the Dakota. Late in the 1960s, the marker began to receive attention once more. There were several attempts to damage the monument, including red paint being poured on the stone to represent blood, and another attempt to set it aflame. The language of the stone itself was cause for concern, let alone the controversy behind the hangings. The marker called the Native Americans Sioux Indians, which was demeaning and insulting. Around the same time period as these individual protests toward the marker, the American Indian Movement was formed in Minneapolis in 1968. The organization worked towards Native American rights and empowerment, as well as attempting to gain political representation. In 1969, another Indian group took control of Alcatraz Island in order to bring attention to the struggles faced by all Native Americans. In 1971, the American Indian Movement, along with counterculture and Vietnam protests by students at both Mankato University and the U of M, started a larger conversation about taking down the monument to replace it with a more appropriate memorial. Not only were students and Native people upset over the marker, but also those on the city council began to discuss it. In an article from the Mankato Free Press on February 16, 1971, Councilman Comiskey indicated that he was not opposed to some other type of historical marker at the hanging site, but he called the granite slab inappropriate as a commemorative piece. Similar to the problems faced by commemorating the execution of the 38, there are also people speaking out against memorials representing lynchings and the commemoration of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Much like memorials to other traumatic events, this brings up the question of whether or not these events should be memorialized. Although many argued to keep the marker up or even to put it into a museum, the granite marker was moved and stored on October 18, 1971, ironically, to Sibley Park. The derogatory monument was kept at a park named for the man that led the charge against them. In 1974, a group of 50 to 60 Native students bussed down from Minneapolis to pay respects and learn about the event. Upon entering the city, they did not find the marker in the center where they assumed it was and were directed to Sibley Park and the water treatment facility where it was currently being stored. 
The students found the four-ton marker lying on its back, covered in a tarp and nearly a foot of gravel. Not only was this upsetting based on the lack of respect to those who died, but also brings up questions as to how the past can be literally buried. This was the last known location of the marker before it disappeared completely. One theory is that Mayor Stan T. Christ took the monument in the 1990s and threw it into the river. Some reports claim he gave it to the Dakota, while others believe it's buried underneath the current Buffalo statue at Reconciliation Park. In 2005, a reporter from the Mankato Free Press began to search for the stone. In the article, the author states that the stone was last seen on the edge of Sibley Park, and that he received two calls from locals who stated that they witnessed the marker being buried in the dike that was being built up at the time. Whether the piece of controversial history is recovered or not, the original meaning behind the marker was not the right way to commemorate the hangings. Thanks to protests and public outcry, the memorial has been changed over the years to include the native voice and tell the true story of the U.S. Dakota War of 1862. A young man named Bud Lawrence had always been curious about the Mankato hangings of 1862, which eventually brought him to a friendship with a Dakota man by the name of Amos Owen. Owen was a pipe maker and spiritual leader, as well as a chairman at the Prairie Island Reservation. After the marker's removal, these men began planning for a new memorial. In 1972, the first Wachipi powwow was held and was a time of celebration and raising funds in order to build a new memorial in remembrance of the 38. In 1987, Minnesota Governor Rudy Perpich proclaimed a year of reconciliation. In addition to this, local Mankato artist Tom Miller began to raise funds to sculpt a life-size bust of a native warrior out of limestone. During the time he was sculpting, Miller also began campaigning for donations and gave out flyers allowing visitors the opportunity to come and watch him work on the sculpture. Across the street from this, plans were put in together for a park that would serve as a memorial to the Dakota. In September of 1994, a 55-ton stone was placed in a small piece of land across the street from the library where Miller would create another sculpture of a buffalo to add to his work toward reconciliation. What you're looking at at Reconciliation Park and other places is these monolithic monuments um, are moving away from one voice um, and becoming many voices. The park was created in order to commemorate the 38 Dakota men who were executed and allow for a location where visitors can reflect and heal. Minnesota has memorialized the white leaders through counties, schools, streets, and parks. Compared to the small memorial park near Riverfront and Maine, Mankato's largest park is named after Henry Sibley, which has a campground, hiking, gardens, and a petting zoo. Uh, with the U.S. Dakota War, you can get in your car in Minneapolis and in a day drive to seven different sites that are telling a story about the U.S. Dakota War, probably from at least five different perspectives. I mean, you can go to Lower Sioux and you can talk to uh, residents of the Lower Sioux community who are operating the Lower Sioux Agency. You can go to Brown County Historical Society in New Ulm and get the New Ulm's perspective on the war. You can go to Camp Release, you can go to Fort Ridgely, and there's a real opportunity to get a whole bunch of different perspectives. Reconciliation Park is not a huge spectacle, but the location is used today for healing and remembrance. In 2009, a group of Dakota planned a 330-mile horseback trip from Lower Brule, South Dakota, to Mankato. The trip was recorded in a documentary titled Dakota 38 that followed the group as they made their way through blizzards and below freezing temperatures. Dakota 38 can be found on YouTube. In 2010 or 2011, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Baer, who uh, 
was an English professor here at Gustavus and uh, really concentrated on Holocaust studies, um, approached me and, and a few others about uh, you know, the fact that the sesquicentennial, the 150th anniversary of the U.S. Dakota War, as well as the sesquicentennial of, of Gustavus College, uh, were happening in 2012, and you know, might we want to do something? The idea morphed into, let's teach a J-term uh, class on the U.S. Dakota War. And that project, they did a fantastic job, but it, it really took a life of its own. We went to uh, Flandreau uh, to a Dakota homecoming event. We were invited to that. We brought the exhibit. Uh, a couple of students went to Lincoln's Cottage, which is a National Trust for Historic Preservation site in Washington, D.C. And then the exhibit actually uh, went on display at the National Museum of the American Indian uh, Smithsonian Museum in New York for a year and then in Washington, D.C. for a year, too. So, uh, you know, that was just, that was amazing. In August of 2012, Governor Mark Dayton released a statement declaring August 16th a day of remembrance and reconciliation for the events that developed between the government, Dakota people, and settlers in 1862. Not only did Dayton's address denounce the actions of Governor Ramsey and the leaders at the time, but also offered his condolences to those whose families were affected. Reconciliation Park also changed in 2012 when it got a new 10 foot high, 4 foot wide statue designed to look like an animal skin scroll. On one side are two poems in response to the war. On the other, the names of the 38 men who were executed. This was an important piece of reconciliation that was missing. The Dakota Sioux people have been in recent news as protests have sparked against the pipelines being placed in North Dakota. The water protectors at Standing Rock are leading the nation in attempts to stop the pipeline from being built due to its unethical layout as it cuts through the reservation. Many have joined the cause and the protests have been a situation where Native Americans are fighting to make their voices heard. In 2016, the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux painting and the Father Hennepin in St. Anthony Falls were removed at the Capitol, much like the Mankato marker because of their controversial white narrative and derogatory depiction of Native Americans. I'm glad that uh, we seem to be shifting, if, if history is a pendulum, that it seems to be at least tilting in favor of there's more opportunity for more people to share uh, their stories and, and their perspectives. When you ask a Dakota person about the present, they tell you about 150 years ago. And when you ask them about 150 years ago, they talk about today. Uh, so I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty hard for any of us to divorce ourselves from our current situation and our own experience in the way that we view uh, history. The four-ton granite marker that originally commemorated the Dakota hangings of 1862 was not only controversial in its creation, but was also a distasteful and inaccurate way to memorialize the event. Most likely it is deep within the dike near Sibley Park, but its true location may never be known. Reconciliation Park is a much more positive commemoration to the 38 Dakota men and the tragedy but the history of the original marker and its role in shifting to a balanced narrative cannot be lost.